Okay, welcome to episode two. It's Strange Tales in American History. I'm your host, Mr. Beat. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're looking at the Scopes Trial, also known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, which uh, I really hate to call it that, and, and you'll understand why in a moment. I think we should just keep it at Scopes Trial. But it was the famous, widely publicized trial of 1925 that pitted the science of evolution versus the creationism of religion. Both of them came to a head, and this trial became a symbol of that clash, a very big cultural clash that actually lasted for many decades afterward. I live in Kansas, uh, in case you didn't know. I was born and raised here. I did live in Nebraska for a while, so not much different. But Kansas kind of made national news in 2005 when there was a series of debates called the Kansas Evolution Hearings that were held in the Capitol where the Kansas State Board of Education and its uh, State Board Science Hearing Committee were looking at changing the curriculum for the science standards for the entire state, looking at how they might change how evolution and the origin of life would be taught in the state's public high school science classes. These were very controversial, but, you know, culturally, Kansas for many decades had a number of people that resisted teaching evolution in the classroom, or I should say at least teaching it as a standalone without having any alternate uh, theory to compete with it, i.e. intelligent design. So the board ultimately rejected uh, amending the science standards. They still have, they still teach evolution uh, like every other state. But yeah, uh, evolution even in 2020 is something that triggers certain people who happen to be more religious. And, you know, understanding why is really important. So let's go back to 1925, the Scopes Trial, all right? So going back to the 1920s, it's a time of new and exciting technologies, a new, more modern way of life. More people are moving to the cities. You got the flappers. You've got backlash, people pushing back to these new ways that are trying to disrupt the traditional culture, especially in rural areas, small town America. More and more people are moving to the cities, but it, fe it feels like in the rural areas, people are left behind and they're just not having what what's going down with these flappers in the cities, okay? So we're gonna look at an English naturalist first, Go back a few decades before the 1920s. A dude you probably have heard of. He was a geologist and naturalist named Charles Darwin. He came up with the theory of evolution. Evolution today is now widely accepted, but it used to be kind of controversial. And I'm not a science teacher, but in essence, evolution argued that all life had a common ancestor and that all life with better genetic traits adapted and reproduced so that those better traits would live on. That was sometimes the case. Often just random traits would live on. Again, go easy on me. I'm not a science teacher. But this theory holds that humans share a common ancestor with apes and chimpanzees. Not monkeys, by the way. Uh, many Christian fundamentalists, or people who believed the Bible was literal, they just couldn't accept that explanation. It went against the whole creationism story, the whole Adam and Eve, you know, pull a rib out of Adam to make Eve, that, that story. It went against that. And so Charles Darwin publishes his findings, his theories, and throughout the late 1800s and into the 1900s, Darwin's theory of evolution pinned religious fundamentalists against modernists, or those who were sympathetic to the Enlightenment and a more loose interpretation of the Bible using reason and logic. So now we're jumping back ahead to the 1920s. 1925, March 21st, 1925, in Tennessee, the Butler Act is passed. It was a law prohibiting public school teachers from teaching about evolution and denying the biblical account of the origin of human beings. I should note that we're talking about human evolution, 
not other plants and animals. It was named after John Butler, a farmer and head of the World Christian Fundamentals Association, who was a big reason why the law got passed. So the Tennessee House of Representatives made teaching evolution a misdemeanor. It was passed unanimously. In response, a new organization called the American Civil Liberties Union, known today as simply the ACLU, they freaked out about it and immediately planned a way to fight it. One of the reasons why, actually, of all places, this happened in Dayton was because of a guy named George Rapalia, I think is how you pronounce his name. He actually was a businessman in Dayton who was worried about the population shrinking in town. People were leaving the town, and he was trying to bring in more people. He wanted out-of-town dollars to Dayton to boost the economy, and so that's why he reached out to the ACLU. Well, let's look at Dayton, Tennessee. They just needed to find a teacher who would teach evolution in class. Unfortunately for them, a lot of teachers turned them down. Although the superintendent was definitely on their side. Finally, they found their guy, John Scopes. 24 years old at the time. Scopes actually regularly taught math and physics, so he did not teach biology. Some accounts say that he was more of a substitute and coach, but regardless... They got him to agree to break the law, which apparently he was already doing anyway. And he read a chapter of the Tennessee State Science textbook, which described evolution. Later on, Scopes would say, I don't think I really even taught them that much. So it was a publicity stunt. They knew what they were doing. Everybody was ready for it. Scopes goes to work that day, and as predicted, there's, there are witnesses to see it. He teaches about evolution to those those high school students who are so vulnerable and believe everything they hear. Scopes was charged on May 5th, 1925 for teaching about evolution and arrested. He got a misdemeanor. It was a citation. But of course, they knew what they were doing all along. The newspapers, of course, found out about it, and this really caused a stir in the community. On May 9th, there was a preliminary hearing so the ACLU got a pretty good and well-known lawyer to defend Scopes, and that was Clarence Darrow, although they first reached out to H.G. Wells and he turned them down. Darrow was approaching 70 years old and about ready to retire. Clarence Darrow was known for recently acting in defense for the also well-publicized Leopold and Loeb murder trial. And he actually was an atheist who definitely seemed passionate about this cause. But because he was about to retire, at first he turned it down. Uh, one thing that really swayed him was the fact that the lawyer on the other side would be another famous and even more famous lawyer named William Jennings Bryan. He would be leading the prosecution for Tennessee. And so at that news, Darrow was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this. So this would be his final trial before he retired. The two lawyers were quite different. Like I said, Darrow went around questioning the existence of God, while Bryan was a devout Christian who was troubled by Darwin's theory of evolution. So both sides were passionate about the ideas, okay? They were not unbiased or indifferent about all this. Oh yeah, and Brian was, remember, he was the guy who was a three-time presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. He became very close to becoming president. He was a former Secretary of State, for crying out loud. So a lot of people already knew who William Jennings Bryan was. With all that in mind, the topic is as contentious as ever at this point. The grand jury meets on May 9th, 1925. To get ready for the grand jury, Scopes actually asked uh, students to come testify against him. The case was pushed forward and the trial set for July 10th. Brian came to Dayton, Tennessee three days before the trial, stepping off a train, and he had a huge crowd greeting him. Already the crowds were there days before the trial. He posed for photographs, gave a couple speeches. So what's crazy about William Jennings Bryan here is he makes this kind of like a crusade. I mean, he's like, yeah, I'm going to defend the anti-evolution law, but I'm also going to go one step further. I'm going to debunk evolution entirely as if he's like this grand scientist like Einstein and he's just going to reverse the course of scientific history. Darrow, on the other hand, uh, 
arrived to Dayton with little attention, just very low key. Hardly anybody knew that he was in town. So complete opposite receptions here. And by the time this all gets started, it's it's very hot out. This is before air conditioning, okay? This is Tennessee in the middle of July. Lots of heat and humidity. The crowds are pouring into town from all across the state. And the courthouse is filled to the brim two hours before the first day of trial was scheduled to begin. So you had people that were just you know, filling up the room, but also the people were spilling into, into the hallways and then out onto the lawn outside of the building. There were about a thousand people there, 300 standing in the courthouse. When Brian got there, there's a huge applause. Uh, and then Daryl gets there, you know, eh, okay. <laughs> but they shake hands. Then there was the judge, John T. Ralston who would be the presiding judge of the trial. He actually wanted to move the trial under a tent that would have seated 20,000 people, but they decided not to do that. Ralston was a character. He was a very conservative Christian who did like the publicity. He wanted the spotlight on him. They also had announcers ready to send listeners to the first live radio broadcast from a trial. The press came out in droves. It was a carnival-like atmosphere. You had vendors selling hot dogs and soda, and even Bibles, and even monkeys. They had actual chimpanzees there, too. <laughs> Two separate trainers brought chimps to town. And William Jennings Bryan uh, supposedly said, Well, wonderful, when he saw them. Remember, chimpanzees are not monkeys. Even though chimpanzees are not monkeys, soon Dayton had the nickname of Monkey Town. And every single aspect of this trial was on the front page of the tabloids all across the country. So think of like the O.J. Simpson trial of the 1990s. This is the equivalent, but even bigger, in the 1920s. You had a jury of mostly middle-aged farmers, and most of them were regular Christian churchgoers. The trial began a bit ironically. They had a very long prayer to get it started. The first day, you had testimony repeated, uh, Basically, more procedural stuff. But outside, people are going crazy with barbecues, concessions. You had all kinds of carnival games going on. When arguments began, Clarence Darrow began his defense of scopes by working to establish, you know, uh, that evolution was scientifically uh, valid. That he was just teaching the respected science of the time that was well-researched and well-backed up by all kinds of science. The prosecution focused on the Butler Act as an education standard for Tennessee citizens, and they definitely cited previous laws and rulings by courts. So the ACLU, uh, originally they wanted to just oppose the Butler Act on the grounds that it went against the teacher's individual rights and academic freedom, and therefore was unconstitutional. But because of how Clarence Darrow was tackling everything, this changed as the trial progressed. The earliest argument that was proposed by Darrow was that there was actually no conflict between evolution and the creation account in the Bible. In other words, you can actually combine creationism and evolution, that they could complement each other. And in support of this, they brought in eight different experts on, on evolution, but the thing is the judge wouldn't actually let the defense use any of these scientists as witnesses. So they could just give written testimony, but they couldn't actually go to the witness stand. There was one exception to that. That was the zoologist Dr. Maynard Metcalf from John Hopkins University. But other than that, it was just written statements. So uh, Darrow was not too happy about this. And he made a sarcastic comment to Judge Ralston on how he had been agreeable only on the prosecution's suggestions. The judge wasn't having it, and Darrow almost got himself in trouble with being found in contempt of court. But yeah, Ralston was definitely very biased towards the prosecution. Definitely agreed with the law. Did not really hide it very well that he agreed with the law. Even at the beginning of the trial, he quoted Genesis, the, the book from the Bible, and the Butler Act, and he warned the jury not to judge the merit of the law itself, but the violation. And he called it a, quote, high misdemeanor. Brian, when he was arguing for the prosecution, he targeted evolution. And he said that teaching children that humans were but just one of 35,000 different types of mammals was ridiculous. 
And he, he repeatedly thought that, you know, that this claim that we descend from monkeys is ridiculous. I mean, I, it was pretty obvious that William Jennings Bryan didn't really understand evolution very well, but he was very passionately <laughs> attacking it. In the first arguments, uh, both sides really made this a epic battle. I mean, Bryan said, quote, if evolution wins, Christianity goes. And then Darrow argued, quote, Scopes isn't on trial, civilization is on trial. There was another lawyer for the defense uh, for Scopes named Dudley Field Malone, who really had some good speeches during it. And he compared what was going on at the trial to the Inquisitions uh, in Spain. Um, he argued that the Bible should be preserved in the realm of theology and morality and not put into a course of science. Basically saying that Brian's, quote, duel to the death against evolution should not be made one-sided by a court ruling that is completely ignoring all of the chief witnesses for the defense. The fact that the judge didn't hear any of the de defense uh, witnesses, that was something that really troubled Malone in particular, and when he finished with his little speech, the courtroom erupted into cheers. Scopes later said that Malone's speech would be the dramatic high point of the entire trial, and Brian had a really hard time after that trying to save face. So we get to the sixth day of the trial, and the defense now has no more witnesses. It's not like the judge is letting them go up and testify anyway. Judge Ralston had even said that defense testimony on the Bible was irrelevant and should not be presented to the jury anyway. And so you're, you're basically just having the lawyers shouting back and forth. And still, at this point, the crowds are out the door. The whole country seems to be watching at this point. On the seventh day of the trial, the defense asked the judge to call Brian a witness to question him on the Bible. And Darrow wanted this because Darrow had a plan. He, you know, was saying, trying to flatter Brian, saying, hey, you're a Bible expert, so let's get you on the stand and let's question you about the Bible. And this testimony really kind of got crazy. So William Jennings Bryan goes up to the stand as a witness to try to show that he knew the Bible well, he knew the history of it, and uh, Brian didn't really see the trap. He just went up there anyway. He probably shouldn't have. So much of the questioning that Darrow had for Brian was around the book of Genesis, including questions about whether Eve was actually created from Adam's rib, where Cain got his wife, how many people lived in ancient Egypt. I mean, he just went on and on about these specific details that didn't really make sense from the book of Genesis. And the reason why Darrow did this is to show examples to suggest that the stories of the Bible cannot be scientific, you know, that they should just be interpreted not literally, but figuratively, and should not be used in teaching science. And Darrow told Brian, quote, you insult every man of science and learning in the world because he does not believe in your full religion. Brian's uh, response to that was, quote, the reason I am answering is not for the benefit of the superior court. It is to keep these gentlemen from saying I was afraid to meet them and let them question me, and I want the Christian world to know that any atheist agnostic, unbeliever, can question me anytime as to my belief in God, and I will answer him. But yeah, Brian had a hard time answering all these questions. Um, he, knew that he, was starting to he knew that he was starting to look like an idiot by the way he was answering these, and so he was just kind of give giving him non-answers. There was uh, some heated moments because of this. The crowd was getting wild again. Uh, after one angry exchange, Judge Ralston actually had to bang his gavel and just say, hey, we need a little recess here for court. Those confrontations did last about two hours, and again, that was on the seventh day of the trial. It is likely, it would have probably continued the next morning, but Judge Ralston was like, you know what, we're going to end it there, and uh, let's, let's leave this out of the, the record. So again, the trial lasted eight days, but it only took the jury nine minutes to deliberate. Scopes was found guilty on July 21st, 1925, and ordered by Ralston to pay a $100 fine, which is the equivalent of about $1,500 today. Ralston imposed the fine before Scopes was given any opportunity to say anything about the, why the court should not give him that punishment. And only after that punishment, Scopes finally got to say, quote, Your Honor, I feel that I have been convicted of violating an unjust statute. I will continue in the future, as I have in the past, to oppose this law in any way I can. Any other action would be in violation of my ideal of academic freedom, that is, to teach the truth as guaranteed in our Constitution of personal and religious freedom. I think the fine is unjust. 
So William Jennings Bryan actually died just five days after the trial's conclusion. And even to this day, historians debate whether or not the, the trial was connected to his death because of the stress that he was going through um, in that trial. Scopes and his lawyers in the ACLU appealed to the Supreme Court of Tennessee. So this wasn't over yet. A lot of people don't realize this. Their arguments were, first, that the statute was overly vague because it prohibited the teaching of, quote, evolution, which was a very broad general term. Second, Scopes and his team argued that the statute violated his constitutional right to free speech because it prevented him from teaching evolution. Third, it was argued that the terms of the Butler Act violated the Tennessee state constitution, which provided that, quote, it shall be the duty of the General Assembly in all future periods of this government to cherish literature and science. Well, the argument was that the theory of the descent of man from a lower order of animals was now established overwhelmingly by most of the scientific community, and so preventing the teaching of such a theory was a violation of the legislative duty to cherish science. Fourth... Scopes and his team argued that the statute violated the provisions of the Tennessee Constitution that prohibited the establishment of a state religion. Well, the Supreme Court of Tennessee wasn't having any of those arguments. However, due to a technicality, the conviction was actually thrown out. <laughs> and then flash forward a few decades later, in 1968, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Epperson v. Arkansas that anti-evolution laws violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. And then a few years later, in 1981, you had Segraves versus the state of California. A woman named Kelly Segraves sued California, arguing her children's right to free exercise of religion was violated by the teaching of evolution, but she lost the case and then McLean versus Arkansas Board of Education. The next year, the court ruled that Arkansas's balanced treatment of creation and science and evolution, science, you know, equal parts, that went against the law. In 1987, you had Edwards versus Aguillard, and the court ruled Louisiana's Creationism Act, which only allowed evolution to be taught in public schools if it was taught with creation science, was unconstitutional. You had Paloza v. Capistrano Unified School District in 1991. A biology teacher sued the California School District for being forced to teach evolution without discussing his personal religious beliefs. Well, the Supreme Court declined or even review that case after it was appealed. You had Freeler v. Tangi Pahoa Parish Board of Education in 1997. This was with the Louisiana School Board requiring teachers to read a disclaimer that defended the biblical version of creation before teaching evolution. The court ruled this unconstitutional and finally... In 2005, Kitzmiller v. Dover, a Pennsylvania federal district court ruled that intelligent design was a form of creationism and unconstitutional to teach in public schools. So, Brian may have won the case, but Darrow won the war. So, John T. Scopes, uh, after the trial was over with, he ended up uh, having his job back. He didn't get fired or anything. That trial kind of haunted him for the rest of his life, though, and he got letters for the rest of his life, and lots of people definitely harassed him. For several years after that, teachers had to sign a pledge promising that they would not teach evolution. Supporters of both sides claimed victory following the trial, but ultimately it was evolution that won out. But overall, the Scopes trial showed that although the majority of Christians said evolution was wrong at the time, there was a growing divide even among Christians about finding the truth. One of the fundamentalists who believed in a literal, strict interpretation of the Bible, and the Darwinists who believed in applying modern science. And so you did have a lot of Christians who didn't fit into that anti-evolution camp. In the end, it really just helped promote the idea that laws should respect academic freedom, even if those ideas clash with mainstream religious beliefs. And I think it's an important cultural moment in American history because it shows you the constant struggle between the old and the new, between progress and tradition. We see it today with other issues. We see it with climate change. We see it with vaccines. There are debates that continue, and a lot of people just don't trust science. They don't trust scientists. 
Uh, they hold on to beliefs or belief systems that contradict those scientists. Uh, so I think it's still very relevant here almost 100 years later. So that was the story of the Scopes trial, or Scopes monkey trial, as some call it. This has been Strange Tales in American History. I'm Mr. Beat. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.